Good morning, this is Morning Coffee with Jesus. Today you're going to hear a message that me and my husband taught about at Word of Life Church on relationships. It doesn't matter if you're single or married. This topic is great to hear how God intended a relationship to be. So if you have your coffee and your Bible, let's begin. So, he begins to talk to people to give them instruction to move on your behalf, on my behalf, on everybody here, everybody watching. But, if we don't listen to his voice, or let's say we do listen to his voice, we hear him loud and clear. Gotcha. I, I know you told me to do that. But we don't do it. It's just as bad as it's not hearing. That's right. So we have to not only have that faith, we have to begin to operate with that faith. Mm -hmm. Then we have to begin to put action. Okay, so we're, we're doing more than just sitting there saying, it's all up to God. If he wants me to have it, I'll have it. If he doesn't, I guess it just wasn't meant for me. No. Well, no we have a part, if his we have word a part, says it's meant for you, guess what? It's meant for you. You're not exempt. That's right. You're not that that case of like, well, you don't know what I've done. Okay, well, get it right. So you messed up. Big deal. You know you missed it. You know where you missed it. That's great. Hallelujah. Change it. Amen. Don't sit around and complain about how... God's not going to do this for you because you're not living right and, you know, everything's just bad. And That's right. You can change the outcome of your future. That's right. If you really want to. Regardless of your past. Regardless. But again, it takes you saying, I'm not going to sit here and sulk anymore. I'm not going to throw this pity party of everybody I need you to. Because now in today's, in today's world, people are like, you owe me something. I deserve that. Careful. <laughs> do you really, do, I mean, honestly, do you really deserve that? It was Keith Moore. He was talking about how um, people tend to basically get in this state of me, me, me. Why are you not doing this for me? And they are, they don't even realize what they're doing. They're demanding things from people. And what he was saying is never, we should never expect anything from natural people. Right. Now we should expect everything from God because he's the one that's our supply, that's given it to us. But we should never demand anything from natural people That's right. and this is where I think the world has got it wrong because what do they do they're constantly putting demands on people right. well I mean I did this for you so I mean you know you know how that works I'll do this for you you do that for me yeah you rub my back that's right this. and it never fails that people are always gonna bring up what they did for you That's right. so yeah don't you remember when I did that for you yeah uh huh. How much money did I want? You never paid me back. So, I mean, the least you could do. So, what are they doing? They're trying to put guilt and condemnation That's right. on other people. Right. And that is not how God intended you to prosper. That is not how He wants His children to operate. That's right. He wants us to live an abundant life. Because he's the one that's giving it to us. That's right. Not because somebody else, we tricked them into giving us something. Absolutely. And if you think about it, we are supposed to operate in his word. This, this word, this is a guideline for how we're supposed to operate. But even if you want to get down to the basic of it, the, the Bible says, scripture says, God is love. Okay, he is the agape love, the unconditional love. Unconditional love doesn't require or expect anything in return. That's right. It doesn't, it, so be, we are blessed to be a blessing. That's right. When you're blessed to be a blessing, that means that we're supposed to operate in that agape kind of love, in that 
unconditional love so that we're able to be a blessing to somebody else, to show them love without expecting anything in return. Right. Without ever thinking about it again. I absolutely do everything that I can to operate in this kind of life and, and choose to do this. If, if our world would operate in unconditional love, in agape love, we would get rid of that persona and that justification of what about me? What about me? See, if you are operating and believing and standing on the fact that God is unconditional love, the agape love, without expecting anything in return, and that's how we're supposed to operate, you don't have to worry about me because God's going to supply. He's going to take care. We are going to prepare ourselves to be able to receive where he opens up the windows of heaven and pours out blessings into our life so that we can be a blessing to somebody else. But so much of the problem in today's world, especially in this country, um, people don't love each other anymore. Not only in relationships, because, and, and look at how Satan took, and, and the Spirit just showed me this. It started out several years ago, and it started out whenever kids were in, well, when I was there, it was in high school, but now it's in middle school and even elementary. It's, it's ridiculous. But they desensitized the use of the word love. Right? I love you. I love you. I love this. I love that. You know, oh, do you love this? Or, oh, I love that. I love this place. I love these shoes. I love this car. And then it transitions into, oh, well, I love you. Right? And then when life happens and because there is still the traditional when you're in love with each other then you get married well reality sets in and you find out that because you weren't rooted and grounded in love in the agape kind of love you were in the worldly kind of love there's no roots. Pastor Jacob talked uh, to us last night about weeds. He was telling us a story about weeds. After the roundup was sprayed on them, the roots had shriveled up. And they were able to just be plucked out without any effort, without any force. Whenever you're in a relationship where you desensitize yourself to the word love, and you're not rooted and grounded in God's kind of love, there's no roots there. So you're able to be tossed to and fro, when the wind blows, right, you, you, it's, it is what it is. Oh, well, we'll just get a divorce. Then what happens if there's children involved? There's pain. There's anguish. Well, pain and anguish is not love. And so then rebellion comes and hatred comes. And then it just transitions out. But it all started out with twisting the word love and making it out to be, oh, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that you love everything. Right? No. We love God and we love people. We enjoy things. And that's what we, te we teach our children. We enjoy that. You enjoy this. You enjoy going here. If we, ha if we were walking in the Spirit and using our spiritual eyes, we would be hearing from God. Mm -hmm. And those situations that come to where we have the opportunity to show the God kind of love to somebody who really needs it, if we're not prepared, if we're not rooted and grounded in love, we don't have the faith to believe to even be in the situation to give a word to somebody and change their life and change their aspect, change the way they believe, change communities, change this country and the people, the hatred. I mean, it, it, it all goes back to being able to be spiritually in tune and using your faith and walking in love. Well, because think about it. It, it, it does. It all ties in together. Because what is most of the time when relationships are struggling, the first thing that they say to the other person? I don't feel like I'm in love with That's you right. anymore. Feeling. Think about it. We're talking about not seeing with our natural eyes and seeing with our spiritual eyes. If we were able to do that, then that feeling, we wouldn't be relying on those That's five right. senses That's right. of, I don't feel like I like you. I don't feel like I love you. Mm -hmm. That just simply lets you know you need to get more in love with God. Amen. You need to 
completely submerge yourself with his love. That's right. Because if you're not in love with God, then it's going to be really hard for you to demonstrate that kind of love mm -hmm. to someone else. That's right. And, and the thing about it is, when you love God, you want to spend time with him. That's right. It's not a it's not a I have to thing anymore. It's no I want to because I enjoy my time That's right. with God. That's right. When you read the word of God, it's not a boring thing, oh, I'm reading the word. It becomes alive to you. That's right. And you're like, Wow, there's so much revelation, there's so much wisdom and you're reading it with excitement, with expectancy to receive something out of it. But if you're in that state of yeah, I love God, you know, to like the world says love. Mm -hmm. To where I've only known you for two days and I love you. That's right. You don't know that person. That's right. It takes time for you to learn who God is before you can form that trust relationship with him. That's right. Because we do live in a world to where people have made that love not seem of any value. That's right. And when you spend that time with him, and when you get to the place where you're able to hear from him and you're able to see with your spiritual eyes what you're what is coming at you he's going before and preparing the way mm -hmm. so that whenever you do meet that person that you're supposed to be with you both have been seeking God first yeah. and then that time span of well we need to get to know each other and we need to live together and you know we need to make sure that we uh, are compatible in our feelings right we need to make sure that um you know, we enjoy sleeping with each other. Mm -hmm. Those all things go away. The importance of those things don't matter. Right. They're not relevant. Yeah. And so, because we're seeking God first, we're rooted and grounded in love. Right. And because we have that compatibility, believe it or not, this may be hard for some of you to believe. Pastor Rebecca and I, we don't always agree. <laughs> not at all, y'all. We don't always agree. Pastor Rebecca says things that I just don't agree with. I say things she just doesn't agree with. Right? There's even times where we have agreed to mutually disagree. But I still love her. She still loves me. Because we seek God first. We put him above all else. And then these little frivolous things, they don't matter. Now, we support each other. Right. Okay, and so in a situation where we may not mutually agree on something, I'm going to support what she does, period. She's going to support what I say or do, period. Because we're rooted and we're grounded in the God kind of love, we're together. That's it. There's not going to be a place where I don't feel like I love you anymore. I may not like you at this very second, but I love you. In in pretty much everything, but since we were, we're on this relationship thing right now. Um, somebody needed it. Somebody, yeah. So when you're in a relationship with someone, if you're both aiming for the same thing, guess what? Neither one of you can fail. You're both going towards the same thing. That's right. And that's why having God centered in your relationship should be Absolutely. the main core of your your relationship because you're not trying to satisfy this person that person's not trying to satisfy you they're both going in the direction of I want to get closer to God I want to have more revelation of his word and you're both going in that direction you can't go wrong because guess what? If you're both going in that direction, when you get to those disagreements, what are you going to do? Let's take it to the word, baby. That's right. What does it say? And That's guess right. what? That solves the problem. And I'll tell you this also really quickly. If you, if you use the word, as Pastor Rick said, as final authority over a, a disagreement, you will immediately know 
that you're in the wrong yeah. if your flesh gets ticked off. You will immediately know, okay. Yep, that's right. I submit to the word. I submit, let's do it. You'll know. Oh, yeah. Because somebody, somebody is going to give one way or the other. Sure. And whenever you go to the word, somebody must have really needed this. <laughs> when you go to the word in a disagreement, you don't do it arrogant. You don't do it cocky. Right? You don't, you don't say, ha ha, the word says you're wrong. Like, don't do that. Because then the person won't receive. Right? It, it makes it a lot more difficult to receive. You go in love. And we're right back to the love again. You, you do that in love. I mean, you correct in love. You go to the word in love. You make decisions in love. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying, eh, time out. Let me go have five minutes. Let me pray about this. Let me go to the word. And then you come back and you come upon an agreement. And you support. You support. Period. Well, there's a statement that um, we'll end with. And again, it's Keith Moore, y'all. Woo, go watch Keith Moore. Um, he, he said, uh, if you change the way you see a thing, it will immediately change the way you deal with that thing. That's right. Think about that, guys. If you will just change your mindset of how you perceive something, of how someone has told you it's supposed to be, if you'll just change it and line it up with the way God said it is, that will change the whole the whole thing of how you talk to it. That's right. Of how you begin to see it. That's right. Just everything changes. Brother Harold and I were driving down the road the other day, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, and we were having a conversation, and he brought up, I think he said John Hagee's the one that uh, he had heard it from. How you respond and react in a situation depends on how long you're in that situation. So, I mean, that that's exactly what you just said. I mean, and I hadn't even shared that with you, so that's what you call confirmation. Relationships take work. It's not like the movies where you're going on a picnic, long walks on the beach, and love notes all the time. I'm not saying you can't have that in a relationship, but if you're going into it with all these expectations of how you think a person's supposed to be, what she's supposed to do, what he's supposed to do, it creates a problem. When you start putting demands on your partner, it starts pushing them farther away from you. God shows us how a relationship is supposed to be by Christ and the church. Christ represents the husband and his role and his part, whereas the church represents the wife and how she's supposed to act as well. God wants us to have a relationship full of love, not selfish love to where we say, if you do this for me, I'll do that for you but unconditional God kind of love that says, I want to do this for you just because. No strings attached, and I'm not expecting anything in return. Anytime we have questions about a relationship, if we will begin to go in prayer and talk to God and get in the Word and find scriptures that tell us how you're supposed to be as a wife, how you're supposed to be as a husband. It doesn't matter if you're married or not. It's important to already know how we should be acting even before we get into a relationship. If we're both striving for the same goal, to get closer to God, your relationship is going to be strong and firm. And it's not going to be as easy for someone to try and separate the two of you. It's when we get in that selfishness to where... We feel that this person needs to do that for us and they're not meeting those needs or those criteria that we have. That's when we start seeing them the wrong way. And in Amos 3.3, it says, Can two walk together unless they agree? If you can't get on the same page with your partner, it's going to be really hard for you two to be able to keep each other encouraged and built up if you're going two different directions. You have to have God centered in your relationship in order to come together in unity so your relationship stays strong. 
I've been married for eight years and each year I continue to learn more about how to be a better wife. And not only that, now that I have kids, reading the Word of God teaches me and my husband how to be good, godly parents and the examples that he wants us to be for our kids. Because then once you have kids, then you have to be able to come into an agreement so you know what you need to do and how you need to teach your kids. So again, you're not going two different directions, constantly arguing and going against each other's word. Because what it does, it teaches the kids to do those same things. And we don't want to instill the wrong things into our little ones. Or even to family members who are watching your relationship who may not be married yet. Someone's always looking and watching what you do so we want to make sure that we are being that example that God intended. I don't know what type of relationship you're in right now, but I do know that if you start getting into the Word of God and finding those scriptures about how to better your relationship, things will begin to change. Even if you're in a great relationship right now and you think, no, everything's good, I don't need, I don't need to know anything else. The moment you open yourself up and you begin reading the Word of God, your relationship will go from here way above anything that you could even imagine. The movies will have nothing on you. I encourage you guys to reach out to me. Let me know how long you've been in a relationship, how long you've been married, things that have helped you guys in the past to overcome different hurdles that you may have faced. Or you can always share this video to give someone else a different perspective on what it is to have a good relationship. You can email me at morningcoffeewithjesus at hotmail.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Thank you for spending your morning with me, and I'll see you next week.